Well, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the background of Jody Arias and her relationship with Travis Alexander? Jody Arias murdered Travis Alexander in 2008. This is a case I've covered before. In this video, I will focus on the events prior to the crime, looking at what might have contributed to the behavior of Jody Arias. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. Now starting with the background of Jody Arias. Unfortunately, Jody Arias herself is the source of much of the background information in this case. She is not someone known to tell the truth, so that has to be kept in mind when going through this narrative. Jody Arias was born on July 9, 1980, in Salinas, California. Her father, Bill, owned restaurants, and her mother, Sandra, worked as a waitress at those restaurants. When Jody was five or six, she was aggressive toward her younger brother. According to a babysitter, on one occasion, Jody struck her brother in the head with a baseball bat and then pretended she didn't know why her brother was crying. Jody claims that she was subjected to strict discipline when she was young, although, as with many items here, there are disputes about what actually happened. Her family moved to Santa Maria, California, when Jody was around 11 years old. Jody seemed to adjust fairly well. Her performance in school was adequate. She had an interest in art. When Jody was around 15, her mother discovered that Jody was trying to grow marijuana in a piece of Tupperware. Jody's parents called the police on her an unusual parenting strategy under these circumstances. The police talked to Jody and a conspirator of hers about the consequences of growing marijuana. They did not arrest Jody or her conspirator. Worried about a recurrence in criminal behavior, her parents would routinely search her room and monitor her behavior. Jody's curfew was 6 p.m. Her parents were quite restrictive. Jody grew paranoid and became increasingly distant from her parents. Around that same time, Jody was becoming more aware that boys were interested in her. When she was in the ninth grade, she started seeing a teenager who was three years older than her. People started noticing that Jody gave up on her interest and focused on the interest of the person she was dating. Jody's relationship with the young man was erratic, characterized by frequent dramatic breakups and reconciliations. Jody's parents sent her to Costa Rica in 10th grade as part of a cultural exchange. While there, she started dating the 16-year-old son of the host family, claiming that she was not in love with him, but had a good feeling about him. When she returned to the United States, the boyfriend from Costa Rica stayed in touch. Jody said she would move there to Costa Rica, and they could start a family. However, the relationship would not work out, as the boyfriend became possessive and Jody broke up with him. Jody reunited with her first boyfriend as her grades dropped in school, and she became more restless. She was eager to get out of school and move out of her parents' residence. Here's where we start to see some fairly unusual behavior, unlike what Jody had previously manifested. Jody was raised as a non-denominational Christian and didn't seem to be terribly committed to her faith, yet she took an interest in the second coming of Jesus Christ. She predicted that it was going to occur in September of 1997. She apparently told many people about this prophecy. At the same time, she maintained that she was being abused by her parents, claiming that she was being knocked unconscious. She said she was going to leave home. Her parents disconnected the battery in her car so she could not leave, apparently unaware of the concept of a key. Ultimately, Jody waited until one night when the battery was connected and left home with a few of her belongings. She never returned for her senior year of high school. She moved in with her boyfriend and found work as a waitress. The relationship with her boyfriend continued on the same track. Frequent breakups and reunions, at one point, she caught him cheating. In 1999, that boyfriend moved to Medford, Oregon, and Jody moved in with a friend. The relationship status was a bit murky. Apparently, they were still a couple, but they had some distance between them physically. Jody would stop by her boyfriend's residence in Oregon and anonymously leave groceries on his doorstep. She eventually moved to Medford, Oregon to be closer to him, but then started dating someone else from Medford. They moved into an apartment together. Even though she had this new romantic interest, 
she would repeatedly leave items on the doorstep of her old boyfriend, as she had done before. In 2001, her new relationship would also come to an end. Jody moved to Big Sur, California, and took a job in a resort as a waitress. She developed an attraction for her boss. They would become a couple in 2002. Jody was 22 years old at this time. Her boss was 42. They would buy a $350,000 house together in 2005 in Palm Desert, California. They quickly found themselves in financial trouble, so Jody became involved with a multi-level marketing operation called Prepaid Legal Services. She became excited about the company because she believed it would lead to quick cash. When Jody was attending a convention for this company in Las Vegas in September of 2006, she met a man named Travis Alexander. He was a top performer with Prepaid Legal who lived in Arizona. He was about three years older than Jody. Travis was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which I will refer to as LDS. Jody and Travis liked each other right away. Travis would tell his friends that Jody could be the one. He was excited and surprised that somebody as attractive as Jody would be interested in him. His friends were shocked as well. It just didn't make any sense to them. Jody and Travis spent five days together at the convention, but because Jody already had a boyfriend, she told Travis that nothing could happen between them. Right before the convention was over, Jody gave Travis her phone number, which sent a bit of a mixed message. He would call the next day. Travis was actively looking for someone to marry. In all of his prior romantic relationships, he had introduced the idea of marriage and been rejected. He seemed as though he was fairly desperate. Even though Jody had a boyfriend, he could not help but be hopeful about the potential of a relationship with her. Travis invited her to spend the weekend with him at a friend's house in California. Jody accepted the invitation and broke up with her boyfriend of four years. So she broke up before she even went to spend the weekend with Travis. According to Jody, during that weekend together in California, the two had oral sex, but really didn't connect well romantically. Also, Travis appeared to want Jody to develop an interest in the LDS church. He gave her materials on that church. When the weekend was over, they went back to their respective residences, but maintained a long-distance relationship, communicating by phone, text, and email. In November of 2006, Jody was baptized into LDS by Travis. Jody would later claim that just after the ceremony, she and Travis had anal sex. As Christmas was approaching, Jody showed up uninvited at a business event Travis was hosting at his house in Arizona. Other people at the event described Jody as creepy. In February of 2007, Jody and Travis became a couple, so they were officially together romantically, even though they lived almost 300 miles apart. Travis had started to make pretty good money at the multi-level marketing company, and he had lost weight. He found himself with other romantic options, but he could not seem to resist Jody. The relationship was highly sexually charged. Their first time engaging in vaginal sex was in May of 2007. So presumably, they waited for that type of sex because that was a greater violation of the rules of the LDS church. So oral and anal sex were frowned upon, but maybe not too much. But vaginal sex was really something that the LDS church didn't want couples doing before marriage. I don't really think that's what the LDS church says, but this is how perhaps Jody and Travis interpreted their doctrine, the doctrine of the church. Over the next several months, Travis became more distant as Jody started accusing him of being attracted to other women. Friends of Travis would recount how he did like to flirt. Jody and Travis continued to have sex, but this was just about all the relationship consisted of. In June of 2007, the couple separated, but they continued to talk regularly Sex was a frequent topic. In July of 2007, Jody moved to Arizona, not far from where Travis lived. Travis started dating a 19-year-old woman named Lisa, who was part of LDS, but after she found out he was still having sex with Jody, she broke off that relationship. Travis continued an on-off relationship with Lisa. They would break up for the last time in February of 2008. Lisa felt as though Travis was too sexually aggressive, could not control his drive, and was pushing too hard for marriage. Travis then became interested in a woman named Mimi. He considered her exceptionally attractive, 
and thought that perhaps she could help him get over Jody. Mimi rejected Travis, but they remained friends. During this time, according to Jody Arias, Travis Alexander's sexual fantasies became more numerous and unusual. Also around this time, Jody Arias had what some people described as a mental breakdown. She moved in with her grandparents in California. Travis had mixed emotions about Jody's move. He was happy in one sense to create some distance between them, but he also wanted sex. After Jody moved, Travis earned a trip to Cancun, Mexico through the multi-level marketing company. He invited Mimi to go with him. She agreed, but stressed they were just friends. Travis really wanted to impress Mimi in advance of the trip. He was hoping that the trip would lead to something more. He tried to get on good terms with the LDS church to set aside his evil ways. He also started working out and trying to lose weight again. His endeavor of self-improvement didn't last too long. In April of 2008, he was once again communicating with Jody in a sexually explicit manner. Jody started recording their verbal communication. This communication was definitely not PG-rated. The couple would get into an argument at the end of May after Jody logged into Travis's Facebook account. He ended their relationship. On June 4, 2008, Jody Arias arrived at Travis's residence in Arizona at 4.30 a.m., She had obtained gas cans in order to avoid fueling her vehicle in Arizona. She was also in possession of a 25 caliber pistol she had stolen from her grandfather. Jody Arias and Travis Alexander had sex on that day. Not long after 5.30 p.m., Jody stabbed Travis 27 times and shot him in the head. He did not survive. It's not clear if Jody had premeditated this crime. Perhaps she just took the gun with her in order to give new meaning to the phrase, keeping her options open. Jody Arias would be found guilty of first-degree murder on May 7, 2013. After some legal complications involving an appeal, Jody was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now moving to my analysis. I'll start by looking at the history of Jody Arias, then move to her relationship with Travis Alexander. Jody appeared to have a strict upbringing, which may have blocked her from certain experiences, perhaps creating a buildup of pressure as she longed to have variety and adventure. She desired to have freedom. A major part of this was finding a romantic relationship, so a major part of what she wanted. Her style for relating to men seemed to be sexually charged and have a love-hate dynamic. There was a lot of passion, drama, and she always seemed to be looking for the next relationship. She never really had relationship stability, but it appears as though that is what she wanted. She believed that every new love interest was going to be the one, going to bring her status, happiness, wealth, and a family. However, her own behavior contributed to destroying the stability that she wanted. Now moving to the relationship between Jody Arias and Travis Alexander. There's a lot of debate about this relationship. No doubt some of this debate has occurred because of the homicide. It brought a lot of attention to this relationship. Jody Arias painted one picture, and the friends and family of Travis Alexander painted another. What is the truth in this whole situation? First, I'll start with the portrayal that Jody has put forward. Travis Alexander was someone who had a lot of difficulty controlling his sexual desires and fantasies. He was aggressive, single-minded, manipulative, controlling, and a hypocrite. For example, he said he wanted to follow the rules of the LDS Church, but he repeatedly violated their policies. Jody made it seem as though she was more or less passive, someone who had sex with Travis just to satisfy him, to get him to stop asking. It was consensual, and she enjoyed it some of the time, but not always. Sometimes it was really just something she endured. Jody said that she was worried about the spiritual consequences of their actions. She also made it seem as though she was not experienced with the type of sex that Travis wanted. Travis's demands were somewhat new to her. He was asking for encounters that were bizarre and extreme. Those who knew Travis painted a different picture. He was a victim in this. He may have been a little enthusiastic as far as his sex drive, but Jody was much more experienced and had a stronger sex drive. She was the one pushing for more sex. He was trying to get away from her, and she kept chasing him, like moving to Arizona and going on frequent trips with him, although, of course, they both agreed to those trips. 
Friends and family told stories of Travis's tires being slashed, Jody stalking him, following love interests of Travis. She read his emails and text messages. She was always telling Travis about how other men were interested in her, thereby making him jealous. So he was not a completely willing participant. She kept manipulating him, pulling him into a relationship with her. So back to the question. Considering these two different accounts of what happened, what is the truth? I suppose it will never be known, but here's my opinion. Jody Arias was looking for something that her very nature made unobtainable. She wanted a stable relationship, but then introduced chaos into her relationships. For whatever reason, she was attracted to Travis, perhaps seeing him as someone who would be a good provider. Maybe it was the fact that he was unattractive and yet still was looking for someone else. Like this confidence puzzled Jody. Why was he creating distance with her? Perhaps that didn't make any sense to her, just like it didn't make any sense to Travis's friends that she would be interested in him. Travis was outgoing, well-liked, and somewhat successful financially, but his physical appearance, immaturity, strong sex drive, shallowness, and awkwardness made him undesirable to women who he was interested in. He didn't have trouble making friends, but finding romance was a different story. He felt a tremendous amount of pressure to get married because his friends had partners or they were married already. Also, when he met Jody Arias, he was 29, and he really got hung up on how important the age of 30 was in terms of where he was with any type of marriage. At the same time as being desperate, Travis also wanted a perfect partner. After meeting Jody, Travis sees that all his fantasies are possible. He thinks of her as out of his league, but she likes him, and she likes sex, which is something he likes too. He becomes very excited about the prospect of a relationship with her. Travis is a little torn, however, because of his own religious beliefs. He feels guilty about giving in to his desires, and even though he is responsible for his behavior, he starts to look at Jody as a source of evil. She is a temptress who he cannot resist. She is a physical embodiment of his own moral failings. She reminds him of his hypocrisy. His encounters with her are characterized by pleasure, but soon after, guilt and shame. Travis has a boost in confidence because Jody was attracted to him. This helps him to become more attractive to others and focus on personal improvement. He goes on a mission to find the ideal love, someone who is as sexually attractive as Jody and as interested in sex as Jody, but who is more dedicated to morals. In his mind, someone who is marriage material. As all this is going on, Jody gets it in her mind that she must have Travis. She moved to Arizona, slashes his tires, spies on him, and all those other stalking behaviors. She's desperate to keep him, but the only way they seem to be connecting is through sex. She uses that to try to keep the relationship together, but at the same time, she is angry about the way she's being treated and his hypocrisy. So he's saying that he should be treating her in a different way, but he's not doing it. She records conversations that are embarrassing to Travis, perhaps in order to get revenge someday, to gain leverage over him, or both. She is angry, and she wants him to pay. She cannot handle the idea of being rejected. Travis's upcoming trip to Mexico, even though unlikely to result in a romantic relationship with Mimi, who only wants to be friends, is still threatening to Jody. Jody drives to his residence and makes one last attempt to use sex to maintain the relationship, but her strategy fails. Unable to cope with losing, Jody resorts to homicide. Travis pays the ultimate price, and no one else will ever be with him. During her trial, she uses her time on the stand to obliterate what little is left of Travis's reputation, even going to the point of suggesting he had a sexual interest in children. I think the bottom line in this case is that Jody and Travis were both troubled individuals. I think the irony is that they were both incomplete. Neither one could see themselves as others could see them. Potential or actual romantic partners viewed each of them as good in certain ways, but very bad in others. They were both manipulative. They both used people. Neither one of them seemed to understand how to appropriately express their desires. They had strong feelings of love and hate toward each other, attracted by one attribute, like sexual attractiveness 
or stability and repulsed by another, like neediness or being manipulative. They couldn't seem to get away from one another until Jody Arias finally decided on an extreme way to separate forever. Those are my thoughts on the relationship between Jody Arias and Travis Alexander. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.